Well, hey everybody, it's Romania Black, and yeah, so yesterday I watched Vinland Saga episode 14 after, after I got back from my trip, and today, what the best feeling is, right? You get back and you get to watch two back-to-back -back Vinland Saga episodes, and they're both connected. Haha! -ha. The only sad thing is, last episode was pretty much absolute pain, so... <laughs> This episode, maybe, maybe it won't be, right? Maybe Gardar and Arnheed will get to have a really lovely moment together. <laughs> but like I said in the last reaction, I am terrified because we have all of this trouble brewing at Kettle's farm. We have Gardar thinking that Snake is Kettle and wanting to kill him. We have Snake wanting to, you know, abide by the rules of the island, but not really feeling the greatest about them. You have Arnheed who's pregnant with Kettle's kid, dealing with the fact that her former husband, still his husband, Snake says he's not her husband, has returned. And then you have Einar and Thorfinn who are just caught in the middle of it trying to figure out what do we do? Do we meddle and get involved or do we sit on the sidelines? Do we weather the storm or do we dive straight in? And amidst all of this chaos, there is the looming threat that Canute is slowly making his way there and that Leaf is making his way there with Thorgal and Kettle and Olmar. It's just a recipe for disaster. And I honestly don't know what's going to happen this episode. I, you know, we, we saw Arnheed go towards, go towards Gardar in the woods. Is she actually going to make it there? Is Einar and Thorfinn going to stop her? Is Snake going to stop her? When she gets there, how is she going to treat his wounds without being seen? There's just, there's a lot of question marks around what's going to happen in this episode. And I'm really curious to see where it goes. And we're at episode 15. So we still have a very big chunk of the season left to go. Lots of things can still happen. Like the fact that Gardar has come three fourths of the way through the season is kind of crazy to me. So there's plenty of time for many things to happen. But I don't have any comments <laughs> to go through since I just got through looking at the comments from yesterday. Um, I just put episode 14 out on Patreon today and tomorrow um, this episode will be going out on Patreon and episode 14 will be out on YouTube. So I'm back in the swing of things. I'm caught back up, which feels good. Um, I normally watch the episode for Patreon on Monday when it comes out anyway. So I'm, I'm all caught up. So there we go. But um, before we start, I want to give a really quick shout out out to the special patrons on our philanthropy tier who helped to make these reactions possible. So for those that donate extra each month because they're kind, consider it because they like my content, they somehow like me rambling about these shows that I enjoy, I'm really, really grateful. So I want to give a huge shout out to Dana, to Edgar, to Be Happy, to Shimoyama, to Arjo, to Kinney, to Eric, to Sunspots, to Translucent Men, to Be Happy, to, uh, to Tyrone Tyrone, to Truck, to Dana, and to Anime Annie. Woo! And to Nameless Monster, y'all! There's a plethora of you, and I'm super excited and very grateful that you all support me. Thank you so much for being awesome and amazing people. And thanks to Patreon in general. Thanks to the people who are even in the $1 tier, the $5 tier. Y'all help me do the things that I enjoy. And thanks to everybody that supports on YouTube because I like hearing your comments, as long as they're not spoilers. <laughs> so, with that being said, all of my love. Thank y'all so much. I This shirt felt appropriate. Big shark on it, skeletons. Sounds pretty appropriate for this storm that's brewing in the background. I'm excited to see what we get y'all. I hope y'all are too. But we're not going to waste any more time. We are going to dive right in and see what we get. So let's watch season two of Vinland Saga episode, thir episode 15. We're going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's a go. Well, <laughs> oh, um, yeah, so, so that episode actually, all things considered, from the halfway point on, went a lot differently than I expected. A lot differently. I I was really thinking this episode was gonna be like twists and turns and like about the escape, which it very may it may very well be going into the next episode. It may very well be. However, I really I really thought for a second that Arnheed was gonna go back 
and get Anar and Thorfinn involved. And that may still happen, but it has not happened yet. But I was not expecting the second half of this episode to be a very existential kind of layering look at Thorfinn's ideologies about violence now and, and addressing some concerns that we, the audience, have had about Thorfinn's developed ideology and the fact that he's turning away from violence. Anar, Anar is a good springboard. We were talking in the Discord about Anar, and Anar has a big heart, which um, Edgar noted in the Discord can be a double-edged sword, where you kind of, you have a big heart, you want to do all these things, but then when you do all these things, it causes problems because, you know, you try to overstep your bounds sometimes. But I feel that Anar, Anar and Thorfinn are really good like foil to one another and without getting into attack on titan spoilers you know who they remind me of and this will sound like the weirdest comparison but thorfinn and anar to me remind me of armin and jean like thorfinn i never thought in my life i'd be comparing thorfinn to armin but i kind of am and then we're comparing canute with a with aaron so what the hell like like who knew that was coming <laughs> shocker of the century but yeah, Thorfinn in his ideology and what he was talking about, we'll get more into it when we recap the episode and I go back through it, but he was reminding me a lot of Armin saying, it's not good enough just to say, oh, I'm going to fight to defend people that I care about. That, that's not, it's just perpetuating the cycle. It's not changing anything. It's been happening like that for centuries. And until it changes, it's never going to end. And so I like that Thorfinn kind of takes an Armin tone in this being like, you know, we have to do something else, even if it means sacrificing ourselves, even if it means like, he's like, I can't take on any more dead. This is all I got. I don't want to take on any more. Now, will he take on any more? I don't know. I don't know if that will happen. But Anar reminds me a lot of Jean from that series and that Jean is very much wears his heart on his sleeve. He can be a good leader. He's known as a coward, but that cowardice has helped him to like become a better person and grow. Anar was a coward at the beginning of this by trying to like, he wasn't able to save his sister and his mom, but then he grew from it. So in the weirdest of ways, Anar and Thorfinn remind me of Armin and Jean, not only in their character development so far, but in how they are kind of foils for one another. They, they, the way that they talk, the way that they walk through things, the way that they kind of like, yes and but, like challenge each other. That dynamic compares so much to their dynamic in Attack on Titan. It's really interesting. I really like it, but they're not cardboard cookie cutter replicas of Armin and Jean. They're very different and their backstories are very different. So I thought that was interesting. But yeah, I really like that Thorfinn's trying to figure out, okay, well, what do I do? How do I move forward when I encounter people and tell them my dream? How do I make that seem accessible? And Anar kind of challenges him by saying like, yeah, that's a really cool pipe dream and all, but what happens when we run into X, Y, and Z? And Thorfinn's like, I'm working on it, <laughs> right? Ah, oh, but God, Gardar! Ugh! Gardar is, woof, just, just bit a chunk out of that guy's neck. Bit out a chunk of that man's neck. I, Gardar is dangerous, and the thing that worries me about Gardar is, is the fact that he has not, seemingly, does not consider the ramifications of all the people he's killed. He's not like Thorfinn, who carries that weight with him. He's just, the, it's just, these people need to be mowed over so I can be free, right? Which is not much different than the Viking philosophy. And I think that, that that's going to come to a head at some point. They've spent this episode setting up the philosophy of Thorfinn and challenging it and complicating it. And I feel that that was necessary now because I think that eventually Gardar and Thorfinn are going to meet and Thorfinn and maybe Snake's going to be there too. And then all of that's going to come out in the wash, right? And Snake, Snake seems to be at the most conflict in all of this. Snake is, is having a bad day because Snake from the get go did not want to involve Arnheed. He didn't want to get her hurt. But also he knew that her involvement could very well put her in danger and Kettle's child in danger and Spherical's grandchild by extension in danger. And so Snake's like, well, damn it, I've been sent here to protect Kettle and his family. Aren't he? You're technically part of that family now. Quit mucking it up. But at the same time, it's her husband. And so, and he knows that, but it makes sense why he didn't want her to go see him because he's like, no, no, no this guy's crazy. He's gone crazy. And he believes that if he gets you and his kid that's no longer around, everything's going to be fine. Now, the question is, is she going to tell him that the kid's gone? 
I feel like if she's not told him already, she's just holding back from saying anything about that until the last minute. They will talk about the sword wound. Like, Gardar is probably in very, very, very bad shape. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Gardar dies. If I'm being honest, I won't be surprised if he dies in this season. But I don't know. But I wanted to bring White Boar Coon out to not only talk about the ideology stuff with Thorfinn, but also kind of map out, like, where are we at in terms of Kettle's Farm? Because Kettle's Farm, remember it's back at the start of this season when Kettle's Farm was this little paradise where, well, yes, there's a couple indentured servants, and yeah, there's some slaves, but it could be a lot worse. And now we're, now we're here, so yeah. Why not? But, God, this episode was really good. I was not expecting, I was expecting him to like headbutt that guy, but the moment he bit a chunk of his neck out, I was like, oh hell, yeah, why not? Why not? So I feel from the OP, I was a little confused in the OP of the child that in the OP that was a little bit bigger. And for a second, I thought that maybe that was Kettle's kid later on and we did like a time skip. But I think it's just the animation making the baby look bigger than he is. I think it's just the perspective. I think that's it. Because then we cut to then we cut to later. Now, she's holding Gardar like with him bandaged up and everything against the rock, looking like looking like the the Virgin Mary holding, you know, that sculpture. So I don't know if if Gardar dies, I won't be surprised if Gardar dies. Uh, that that won't surprise me at all, right? I don't know. What I wanted to say in the last episode that I kept telling everybody in the reaction that I was going to talk about, and I tried to say it during the OP, is that I love at the end of the OP where there's Thorfinn on the shore by himself, right? He's by himself. He has this ideology. He's an outcast, right? He's a, a Nordic outcast who doesn't want to believe in violence anymore and to cause peace. And on the other side of the river, he sees his father who very much shared that same ideology. And in between them is the river. And I think back to the first OP where the song was called River and it talked about that trudges and how hard it is to cross. And that's a really cool metaphor to bring up in this. It's nice. So yeah, old Gardar is tied up at tied up at the fort, the the fort and she walk she has to walk quite a ways to get to him, right? She had many a chance to turn back and her deciding what to do. And honestly, I'm like, what did you... My big question for Arnheed was like, did she think naively that she was just going to tend to his wounds and that was going to be the end of it? Like, did, did she really think that was going to be the end of it? That that was going to be the case? Because like, sh this guy clearly goes bonkers for her. So, was she... Arnheed is in such a weird place right now. And I guess I'll put Arnheed over here. I would lean over more, but my dog is at my feet. And so I cannot. So Arnheed over here taking uh, taking the water to clean uh, his wounds. Which, by the way, she does not at all. <laughs> that never happens in this to clean the wounds of Gardar. Of Gardar. And... Uh, Arnheed is in such a pickle because it's her husband. She loves him. She hasn't seen him in years. It's the first time she's ever encountered him again. Of course she wants to see him. Of course. But in the same vein, he's clearly changed. He The suffering has made him more violent and more accepting of that violence. He's maybe not the kind and considerate man he once was. I mean, the guy ripped a chunk out of a man's throat and spit it out like it was nothing. <laughs> that that's a thing and so I feel like Arnie is trying to she's trying to have the best of both world worlds she's trying to see her husband and talk to him and and make peace with him but in the same vein she is also trying to protect her child that she has and have some semblance of normalcy and peace and it's just this big tumultuous mess and I, I don't blame Snake for not wanting her to go near him. Because Snake's like, I know how this song and dance is going to go. He's like, I know how this is going to go. He's like, the moment you go over there, he's going to try to get you to help him escape. He's going to tempt you. You love him, so that's going to be even worse. And he's going to, he may try to verbally manipulate you, whatever. Like, Snake knew the writing on the wall the moment she showed up. And he was like, mm-mm. And 
he left her, the problem was he left her with a, a bad guy. I'm like, Snake, you should know your men a little bit better because the guy even said his weakness was women. I was like, why'd you leave her with the man whose weakness is women? I would have taken her back on the horse. I, if I had been Snake, I would have grabbed her on horseback and taken her back with the horse. That's what I would have done. But hindsight's 2020. So yeah, she gets close. I love just the, the silence and the wind. And so the what the hell is not from seeing her, but from Snake evaluating the situation. So I'll put Snake up here. Snake, Snake's having a bad day. He's having a bad day because things are just, things go from bad to worse. He says he can wait till tomorrow. And Fox says, it's not my decision. The mistress insisted. So, okay. So, S Snake doesn't like the mistress. I, I get full and well, Snake does not like the mistress. Doesn't care for her. Doesn't seem to give a hoot. Right? He only seems to care for Spherical and, and doing his job. So, the mistress has insisted. And I want to go back. I think it's to kill Gardar. I think that's what she's insisting. Right? And he's like, the damn hag! I love it! He's like, they leave security up to us. And he's like, maybe it's about the three horses being offered as a reward. You mean she wants a share? Ah, okay. So the question is, she wants, he thinks that she wants a share of the three horses. Okay, so Gardar, the reason why they didn't just outright kill him is because they're going to trade for the three horses for the family that lost the brothers and the dad. Okay, so that's why he didn't kill him to begin with. He's like, we're just gonna trade him for the three horses and be done with it. Done with it, trade with the uncle and just be done. Well, now the mistress wants in on it. Of course she does. And Snake's like, she's so greedy. And the look he has when he sees Arnheed is of absolute shit, why are you here? Why didn't you stay like you were supposed to? Why aren't you watching Spherical? What I like about Snake in this episode is he has this myriad of expression on his face throughout the entire episode where he's just like, I'm what, why I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make it drink sort of scenario where he's like, look, I told you to stay put with Spherical and take care of him. Why are you here? You do I feel like Snake cares about Arnheed enough to not want her to die. Doesn't want the unborn child to die. Maybe he knows about the unborn child. Maybe he doesn't. But I feel like he doesn't want her to die because he knows what she means to Kettle. And because she's just an innocent woman. He's like, why? He's like, if you go with Gardar, you are going to be sentenced to death as an accomplice. Do you not get that? Right? And so he's trying to keep her from going down that route. It, it almost seems like everything Gardar has done up until this point has been unnecessary to keep from there being unnecessary bloodshed. He's like, we're going to tie Gardar up. We're not going to kill him. We're not going to kill Arnheed. We're not going to kill anybody, but we're not going to let him just run off scot-free because he did kill one of our men. There has to be some kind of consequence. So I feel like he's done everything in his power up until now to not kill Gardar, right? And then there she stands. And Snake just is like, man, he's like, I, like, didn't we talk about this? Like, they just make Snake look so good in this. And she asks if, if, she can see her husband. And he says, no. And she's like, well, how are his wounds? And Snake says, I don't give a shit. Which Snake, Snake does a really good job of throwing things to the side. Of just being like, don't care. When, when in reality, you know, he kind of does care a wee bit. He does actually care. But again, he's in front of Fox and Badger and the others. I feel like if it had just been Arn, Heed, and Snake, maybe the conversation would be a little bit different and he'd give her a different explanation of why he can't let her see. But because he's in front of his men and he has this, you know, persona to present, he decides to keep it a certain way and is like, mm, don't care. Let's move on. He's like, why should I tend... Why should I tend to someone who killed one of my men? Which is, yeah, that seems pretty standard. And then he says, here's my horse. I'm going to see the mistress. You guys take Arnheed back to Gramps. And so, yeah. So then the, they, they leave the two horses to go see the mistress. And left her. That was their biggest mistake. Why'd they leave Arnheed with the guy? Why'd they do that? Should have just taken, should have just taken her away. 
And then she sways him to let her see Gardar. I'm like, dude, you done fucked up real hard. Like, like I said in the reaction, the hearts of men are easily swayed. And she just, she didn't even have to do anything. She just had to be like, can I please see him? Please, pretty please. And he's like, well, I mean, maybe I'll make an exception. I'm like, biggest mistake. Big, this guy, biggest mistake. And he had a horrible death. I'm like, dude, that was, that was brutal. That's, this guy tries to be nice, and then it, go, it goes all kinds of hell. Now, I will give the show this. I am very glad the guys did not do a couple of things. I'm glad that, one, they did not tell Gardar, of which they wouldn't know about her pregnancy, but I'm glad they didn't tell Gardar that she was Kettle's. They say Kettle's precious girl, but when they're making the sex jokes about Gardar and her tending to him... I'm really glad they didn't bring up Kettle anymore because that's just fuel on the fire, right? At this point, Gardar already hates Kettle because I'm presuming he knows what he's probably done to her. And so he already hates him. But I'm like, I was fully expecting Snake's men to add more fuel to the fire on top of that and poke fun of that. Glad that wasn't the case. Um, but, but they, you know, they do a pretty <laughs> gross job of just making fun of Gardar and her. I will say this, though. When she's sitting there crying, they kind of just let her cry it out, which I guess could be worse, douches, right? But I Gardar is so conflicting for me, right? Because Gardar, Gardar is very conflicting. Because on the one hand, you see a man that is tortured by not being able to protect his family. Like he is he is overcompensating so hard to try to protect his family because he's he believes he's failed before. He's like I left you all in that village and went off to battle, got captured because our side lost and then you all were enslaved and it's my fault. I didn't listen to what you said before. I didn't stay behind. I was foolish. I made a mistake and he's apologizing to her and then she is apologizing because I don't think originally she was going to let him go. I think originally she was going to be like, I can't. And then the moment they took the chunk out of the one guy's throat, she was like, well, I guess we can get out. Because at this point, at that point, the moment he took the piece of the guy's throat out, it's like, well, he's got to run. She, if she doesn't run with him, she, at that point she's screwed. And that's kind of why I get a little bit frustrated with Gardar because in his quest, he forgets, he forgets kind of about Arnheed's safety a little bit here. Like, it's one thing to go fight for yourself and your own freedom, but like Arnheed, the moment he took that chunk out of that guy's throat, if he didn't take Arnheed with him or there was any hesitation, she could be killed. Her and the baby. But in taking her with him, he is gambling on the fact that they both make it out. Which he fully, he's kind of disillusioned and thinks, oh, we're going to get out. We're going to be fine. But I'm like, if you mess up once and she's captured, she's dead. Like, she, they are not going to be like, oh, well, it was your husband. I guess we'll let you go. No, they're going to kill her. They're going to be like, nope, you were insubordinate and you ran away. Mm -mm. And, and it's so frustrating because we understand why he did it. And he's not in his right mind. He is, he's only thinking of, I'll get you and run away and we'll go home. But like we said in the last reaction in the discussion, what home are you going home? Are you running away to? How are you getting there? It, it's just, it's all flimsy. The plan is flimsy, right? But the emotion between them, I, God, when she reaches her hand and goes to touch him, but she can't, and it's just, in that one scene, there's, there's so much silence and contemplation. And I love it because it's a very show don't tell scene. Like they could be, they could be giving us what she's thinking in her head. They could be giving us exposition, but instead they just let the movement and the gestures and the emotion just bear itself there on screen. And she's clearly thinking like, if I touch this man, if I make that contact, it'll be over. I'll want to set him free. Because I love him. She's like, and I can't do it. And I'm also kind of afraid of him. So I don't want to do it. So there's there's all these things that are just like being put right out there from the start. And then she just collapses 
And he says, let's go home. And they're like, oh, she doesn't have anything to cut the rope with. It's fine. And they tease her a little bit. And he just says that he's sorry and asks for her forgiveness. And the thing of it is, he says, I'll never leave your side or her jaltis again. Like all the things she warned him back when they were in Sweden that he ignored. He's now like, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have ignored you. I won't again. Let me make it up to you. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, ah, well, what do we do? So yeah, I was wrong. Forgive me. And, and, and in her mind, she's like, for him to say that, like, I'm going to get a picture of that shot. For him to say that to her, it it's like all she's ever wanted to hear. But at the same time, it's under the worst circumstances because they don't have their son. Everything's gone to shit. Like, it's just like her grasping her head and crying is the most visceral, like, true, authentic emotion for that moment. It's so well done. I'm like, damn it, Vinland Saga. Damn it. Like, oh my God. And he says, let's start over and it'll be like it was before. But she's crying like, no, it's not. She's like, I'm pregnant with some other dude's kid. We're future, you're a fugitive. If I go with you, I'm a fugitive. We have no future, nowhere to go. She's like, this isn't good. I'm like, oh. it's just, oh my God. And he's like, why are you begging forgiveness? Pull yourself together. Like he, the thing about it is, is it almost seems like he expects, he expects Arnheed to be the strong one. And that's the thing. I, I think that she usually is. Arnheed is very strong and very composed. I think that this is the, the like, she's just at her breaking point. She can't take anymore. She's like, nope, I'm done. I just, I, it's all, all downhill from here. Now, these guys that stayed out in the, that wouldn't stay out in the rain, like you all didn't have an umbrella or like a poncho or something. You left her out in the rain with the one guy who's like, you probably think is the weakest guy weak to women. He established it was his weakness. What the hell? But yeah, I, I thought that she was untying the rope. I thought that when her head was down and her back was to him, she was untying the rope to let him go. That's what I thought. But she actually was not. He's just so freakishly strong that he manages to get away. He manages to like, because he said he goes to grab her and that's the mistake. The mistake is that he grabs her and he jumps up and bites the man's throat. Oh my God. And just, yeah, spits, spits out the, the piece of the neck. Oh my God. And then when she turns around and sees like him bleeding. Yeah. It's not good, Cotton. Nope. Not good at all because he's on the ground dying. And it's just like, what's crazy is he goes, he goes to attack and then it just doesn't work. And he falls over. Okay. And in that moment, like, that is that face that she makes. Arnie does some great expressions in this episode, but that face she makes is like, we're fucked. This is it. He's killed a man. He's killed one of Snake's men again. Snake already said he killed a man once. I shouldn't have to care about him. Now he's killed a second man. It's all going to domino from here. She's like, she's, she's like, why'd I come here? It's like, the look on her face is like, I came here to see my husband and I just got done telling Thorfinn and AR how I wanted to keep my future unborn child safe. This is the most dangerous place I could be right now in the most dangerous situation. Why am I here? Like just that horror on her face is terrifying. And meanwhile, Gardar's like, oh, cut my ropes. Let's go. And she's just like, shit, this is not good. Now, granted, the men that would have told on her that she let him go are dead. I like that guy's subtitle. This is fucked. He's dead. What is he doing? And then he's like, the ropes. It's just like everything's happening all at once. And Arnheed's like, oh my God, what do we do? He's like, they're going to kill us. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to kill you. 100%. And I love that her, 
her clutching her stomach like my child, like, what do I do? She's like, I don't want this to get any worse. I don't want these men to die. But if I don't let my husband free, we're going to die and my unborn child's going to die. And she's like, I've already lost one kid. I don't want to lose another. So it's just, I don't blame her for letting him go. I don't. I, I'm a little frustrated that she went to see him. But that's the price you pay for weathering the storm. You you jumped into the storm. Here we go. I And I don't blame her for going to see him either because it's her husband and she loves him. But ah, this is why we can't have nice things. Right? And so she chose to let him go. And that's the halfway point of the episode, right? And then we see the aftermath. And this scene where it's the ropes are cut with the knife. They left it. That face of Snake looking down at the ropes is a look of pure betrayal. Like he's like, I did everything I could to keep you from going with him. To keep you from seeing him so you could stay safe. And what did you do? You let him go. And now, because, yeah, the thing about it is Gardar is injured. Gardar is injured. And she may know how to tend wounds, but there, there's something. He's got another wound from that battle, which I love how they find it. They're like, I love the little fact that they, like, look at the sword. The blood's washed away, but there's still grease, like body fat, like grease from, like, the fat of your flesh is on the sword. And they can see how deep it went. That's a really cool, like, just way of determining that sort of stuff. It's really morbid, but cool. Um, so they're like, he's got another wound on top of the wound that he already had. He's not going to go very far, right? He's going to stay in the area. And she's going to hide him. But God, that look from Snake. He's just like, are you freaking kidding me? Because, yeah, it's not, just, it's not just the fact that the men are dead. They are, there are limbs chopped off of them. There are severed hands. There's a man with a piece of his throat missing. And these are Snake's men. They may not be, they may be a bunch of Bacas, but they're Snake's companions and his men. And they've all been slaughtered by this one man. Because I'm sure Arnie didn't do a damn thing. No. Uh, oh. He's like, bad news, boss. I like Fox says bad news, boss, they're all dead. I'm like, gee, the guy missing the chunk of his throat and the guy's missing limbs that are lying on the ground prone. I would have thought they were alive. <laughs> I'm like, we shouldn't. Damn, Sherlock. <laughs> That's what I want to say to Fox. Oh, and I love the idea that the episode does as far as animation wise of showing the torch and Snake is silhouetted in complete darkness. Like, his whole character is just like, son of a bitch. Now, look what you made. It's like Taylor Swift, look what you made me do, is like starting to like fade into the distance. Mm -hmm. It's starting to fade into the scene. And he's like, those idiots. And, and the thing is, those idiots, is he talking about his men? Is he talking about Gardar and Arnheed? Is he talking about both? I think he's talking about both. I think that he's he's mad that Arnheed got involved against his wishes. And I think he's mad at his men for underestimating her, right? For underestimating the situation. Because he says, I told them so many times to not let their guard down. So you could argue that he said that about his men, that the idiots were the men. But you could look at it another layer, too, until he said that. They could talk about her and him, too. And yet, the damn hand on the ground. And then that's when the guy tells him to come look at the sword. And that's when they talk about the grease stain that it's been used. And yeah, the tip of it in the mud, it's got, like, there's grease on it. The rain washed the blood away. I mean, that's a good, that's a good six inches into the body. That's a deep cut that's not a graze somebody got there was a stab in there so he's got a pretty severe injury that uh, Mavin did a great job animating the water in this episode it looked really really good he's like it was deep he's like yeah he's like he's got a new injury on top of his existing one there weren't any horses here so they had to travel on foot yeah and he says after him I god I just 
we're going to settle this while he's still on the farm. Oh, I just, I, Snake, his face. Oh, Snake is just, Snake is just absolutely livid that this is just, as soon as we find him, kill him. Yeah, I mean, at this point, at this point, he's killed so many men. What choice does Snake have? Like, when it was the one guy, Lizard, he was like, okay, he killed Lizard. He's injured. We're going to tie him up. Let him be bounty for the uncle. And we're not going to kill him ourselves. We're just going to let it go. And it's fine. But now he's killed four other men. And it's like, well, you've, you've tripled your number from last time. And it's not getting any better. So, yeah, we've got to kill him. Or do we? Because then we have a big conversation with Thorfinn and Einar that I feel is going to somehow tie into this whole this whole situation, right? I I was kind of sad because at first I thought that maybe Thorfinn had stopped having night terrors when he joined Einar, and then Einar's like, "Well, you didn't sleep good either because I didn't hear you groaning in your sleep." And I was like, "Well, so I guess he is still having the night terrors." I love I love Thorfinn's hair, how long it's gotten when he pulls it up. Like, remember when Thorfinn had like the most feral gremlin hair that looked like like a little mop of, looked like there could have been a bird's nest in it and now it's like luxurious. I'm like, when did, the, like, what a glow up. <laughs> but yeah, Thorfinn worrying about Anar and what he was going to do, right? And he says, were you watching me? He's like, I'm not going to do that and get involved. I don't want to cause trouble for Arnheed. Which is hilarious because she's going to, I feel, cause trouble for all of them. And it's like, ah. And so we get into this really good discussion, right? Of what to do. That it doesn't make sense. All we were doing was living quietly. Like, yeah, all we were doing was having this quiet life. And then all this shit happened. And not even on Kettle's farm. Like back even, I feel like Anar's talking back about even when they first were enslaved. Right? The idea here about, so we have this theme. Okay? This theme with Anar and Thorfinn. Our, our two best bros forever sharing this theme about violence. And the idea of how it is wrong wrong for freedom to be taken by violence which i could not agree more with i think that's a really good theme to brought to bring up right and he wants to tie it back to thorfinn and i like that thorfinn like clinches his fist and he's like look he's like i don't have any right to have a dog in this fight He's like, I am not the person who should maybe be speaking about this because I've spent most of my life at war, taking freedom from others, using violence. He's like, so I really don't have anything to say on this matter that will probably relate. I love how Mappa drew Thorfinn, though, like with his swords and everything, with his little knives. I love that, that imagery of Thorfinn. It like perfectly encapsulates him. But the thing is, he says, I was wrong. I was wrong. I think it's funny how we have both Gardar and Thorfinn saying that they were wrong in the same episode. Saying, I was wrong. All right. I like that we have both of those situations. That we have Gardar saying, I was wrong for not staying with you, my family, and keeping you safe. And then we have Thorfinn saying, I was wrong to leave my family to go pursue revenge. So I like that we have two characters both admitting their their mistakes that they've made in different areas, right? And Thorfinn's like, I shouldn't have done what I did. He's like, it's not right. And Anar, I love him just looking over there being like, I don't think Arnheed knows that you are a warrior. And then poor, I mean, I love that Thorfinn closes his eyes. He's so sad because the last thing he wants to do is for Arnheed to know that, that people like him were responsible for her and her family being torn apart. Like you can tell it really affects him. He's like, it's pathetic. I'm afraid of someone like her finding out about my past. Like, yeah, he's like, I don't want people knowing that I was the type of person that could have split their family apart and destroyed their lives. He's like, I don't want to be viewed as that type of person. But you can't blame him. He's like, I was, how was I not bothered by hurting all of those people? 
And I think in a lot of ways, it's the same reason that Gardar is not bothered right now. Gardar is on a war path trying to save his wife and get the life back that he lost. And Thorfinn back then was just on a quest for revenge to try to get, to try to avenge someone that he lost. So I think that Gardar and Thorfinn both have gone through and are going through very similar pathways. The question is, is Gardar going to get, you know, brought back to the light or is he going to sink down further until he's just completely gone? And when Anar says, I can't even imagine you acting like that, I'm like, damn, isn't that something? Isn't that something that a character from season two is like, Thorfinn, were you violent at one time? And it's like, was he? You know, it's amazing that Anar brings that up. I, I love it. And then he says, you told me about eliminating war and slavery from the world. And I like that Thorfinn, Thorfinn has some really great looks in this season, especially in this episode though. Like he, like I, it's seeing Thorfinn in pain as an adult is different than seeing Thorfinn in perpetual feral pain as a teenager. It's a different experience, right? But I love the idea of Einar asking about eliminating war and slavery, which those things are still going on in our world now, a thousand plus years later. So there's not really, I mean, what, what, what can we do, right? This is your Miss America question. Here's your Miss Universe question. How, how Thorfinn, runner up for Miss America, are you going to, or Miss Universe in this case, are you going to stop war and slavery? Uh, you have 30 seconds, <laughs> right? It feels like a Miss Universe question. Like, okay, Thorfinn, you are representing Denmark. Can you please give us the answer of how would you eliminate war and slavery? Um, you have 30 seconds on the clock. Let's go. And so Einar does address the point that Thorfinn has experienced both. He's been on the side of both the warrior and those who have lost. So he must have, he's been on the side of the slave and the warrior. So what ideas does he have as far as eliminating both? Like he surely thought about this. And Thorfinn, I, God, I love that expression. I'm just going to take a picture of that. And he's like, yeah. And Einar's really wanting to hear what he has to say. Like, what should we do? How can we eliminate it? Like, Einar's eyes are so intense. He just, he wants to know what in his heart Thorfinn believes. And Thorfinn's like, look, I can only speak from my experience. I don't have all of the answers. But he talks about how war produces lots of slaves, right? That war basically leads to slavery. And if we stop the war part, then the number of slaves will likely decrease. Not a full, not full proof math there, but it seems sound enough, right? They says that that's probably, he's like, like you and Arnheed. He's like, the line between warrior and slave trader is blurry. Yeah, that, that's such a, that's such a great way of putting it. The line between the two are blurry. Now, from our perspective as the audience, from what we've seen of Vinland Saga season one, I would say that, like, like Askeladd didn't allow slaves. That's the thing. We didn't see a lot of slave trading warriors in season one because Askeladd did not let that shit happen because he was totally against it, right? So we didn't get to see a lot of it, but it's, it's been apparent in this season that they are quite prevalent. And so there's some that are using that tagline of, oh, I'm doing this as a warrior for my people to justify them trying to get slaves. He says slaves come from other places too, but war is the number one source. So if the numbers of wars decreased, so would the slaves. So I like that the whole time Thorfinn is talking, he's not speaking in absolutes. He's not saying if we stop all wars, we'll be good. He's saying... It would be a pipe dream to stop all wars. So if we just decrease the number happening, we would probably decrease the number of slaves that would come from that as well. But Norsemen don't think that war is a bad thing. That's the problem. The problem is not just getting rid of wars. It's about changing. It's about changing mindsets, right? It's about changing mindsets. Because a Norse man, his worth is tied to valor in battle and wealth. Well, 
the currency right now is tied a lot to slavery. So if you're trying to be wealthy, slavery can help you do that. If you're trying to be victorious in battle, the losers become slaves. So it just, it perpetuates that cycle. And so he talks about how slavery essentially becomes a cycle. And then the idea of its generational, of a generational cycle of violence that men just train their sons to be soldiers and send them off. And then that just keeps the cycle going, which makes me respect Kettle a lot more because at least Kettle was trying to keep Omar away from that being like, no, let's not do that. And it res makes me respect Thor's more because Thor's was like, no, let's not do that. So yeah, those two men in their own ways were trying to fight the cycle. And Thorfinn says, the, I love this line. Thorfinn's like, it's difficult to stop doing what you think is natural. What seems like the status quo, it is hard to stop it. And so that, that's where the big problem comes. It's hard to stop something when it seems like it's natural, right? That That's going to be the problem is making people think that it's not natural to do this. And, and Einar says, well, there's people like you in the world. So there's a good chance there are others who share your beliefs. So maybe you're not the only one. And Thorfinn says in Norse society, cowards can't survive, but that's fine. I'd rather be an outcast than be burdened by any more of them. And I love the, the metaphor of the dead, the dead grabbing him and like getting all up on his clothes and like dragging him down. He's like, I've carried all of these people as weight this entire time. I can't add any more. And I love that Thorfinn says, it's not enough for me to atone just by taking them somewhere to rest peacefully. It's not enough just to take them on as a burden. That's not good enough. I love the idea that he says, I've been thinking about what I can do to make up to them. And I love that he, I love his face when he like gets all riled up. And he's like, you couldn't call simply not killing or destroying any more atonement. Yeah, I love that. He's like, he's like, it's not good enough for me just to say, oh, I'm not going to kill anybody more or destroy anything. Like that's, that's kind of flimsy, right? His idea is to do more good to make up for the bad. And that's really what made me think of Armin from Attack on Titan. Again, I'm not spoiling anything I don't feel like by saying this. But one of Armin's big things in the series is doing little things, finding little things of good to do to create a better world overall. Because you can't convince the masses of a policy. You can't convince the masses of an ideology. It's just not, we're all too individualistic, right? We can't say, oh, if everybody believes this, then the world's going to be a better place. That's just not a realistic goal. But I love the idea of if every single person just was a better person for themselves, and for the little people around them, the little pockets of people around them, then the world would eventually, that would spread and interconnect and intermingle and become a better situation. That's what he's saying. He's like, we don't have to try to change massive things. We just have to do little things to make it better. Little moments can make a big difference in the end. He's like, I just want, he's like, a single village would do. I want to create a place where people don't need swords, which is what his dad wanted to do. That place, the place where people don't need swords. Yep. The place without swords. Which kind of is what Kettle's been trying to do, right? And then Anar points out the problematic elements with that, where he's like, but he's like, that's all well and good. I'm glad you want to do that. But he's like, I don't like war either. But what if you have to fight to defend your peace and freedom? He's like, what if you have to defend your island? What's going to happen if you don't? Like, like, what do we do then? Sometimes you have to fight to defend peace and freedom. And Thorfinn's like, that's not good enough. I love how he says that. He's like, no. He says, there's no point if you fight for peace. He's like, any battle that's for peace, you'll never escape from a bloodthirsty hell that way. He's like, there has to be a third option, right? There has to be a third option. He's like, 
He's like, if you just fight for everything around you, you're just perpetuating the cycle. It's not going to get any better. And, and I feel like Thorfinn is getting somewhere. He's getting to a point where he can reach that point that he's wanting to. And he's getting closer to that ideology. He's, he's fine-tuning it as we go, right? And Anar's kind of helping him to fine-tune it. One thing that I was sad about was that Anar immediately was like, so it's never more than a dream. I'm like, Anar just gives up. I was like, dude, no, don't just give up then. I was like, this guy's like bared his, Thorfinn just bared his soul and his life's plan to you. And you're like, I guess it'll never work then. I'm like, damn it, Anar. Damn it. You'd have to travel to the ends of the earth to get away from the Vikings. Somewhere even the Vikings can't reach. And that's when he remembers what the girl, wasn't it? Wasn't Hildegard? Wasn't her? She says, if I ran away to the other side of the ocean, then what's there? And he sees her in the snow. Yep. Go back to season one and sees her. And he thinks of Vinland. Far west beyond the sea. Beyond the, uh, beyond the reaches of authority. And the sad thing about Vinland is if we think Vinland is North America or anything like that, the sad thing is the, the cruel irony is that eventually slavery does make its way over there. That's the sadness about it, right? But that's a thousand years later. So that's, that's nearly a thousand years later, so they wouldn't know. But yeah, I like that he brings up the concept of Vinland. Uh, that Vinland is the idea of this freedom. It's, it's something tangible. And he's like, we can't just go there. Leaf said it was hard to get there. It was going to take a long time. We can't just go there. We got to be careful about that, but it does exist. And I like that we tie back to that leaf and Anar's like, Oh, that's cool. I want to go there. And he's like, and Thorfinn's thought about this. Cause he's, he says, you know, we can't just leave and go to the Island by ourselves. It's too far. And also to create a nation there, we need a lot of outcasts and we just don't have those numbers yet. And Anar's like, well, that sucks. And I love, again, how Mappa animated the puddles in this episode of all things. He says, the first bit of good news I've heard in a while. That there is somewhere out there that they could potentially aspire to go. Like it's giving them some, some type of long-term end goal to get to Vinland. So, so that's good. I like that. I like that we established that. And then Fox and the others show up, right? Looking for Arnheed and the others. And Thorfinn immediately realizes what they're doing. Because Einar's like, what are they doing? And Thorfinn's like, yeah, they're looking for, they're looking for Gardar. And the way that his face, the way that his face changes where he's like, he's escaped. Like, Thorfinn's not happy about it. Thorfinn, Thorfinn has the same look that Snake does. Thorfinn's like, well, shit, this is bad. Because Thorfinn's thinking, well, they're going to try to kill Gardar now. I don't want anybody to get killed. Gardar's probably killed some men himself. Didn't want anybody to get killed. Arnie's probably in danger. And she's pregnant. So I, Thorfinn has the same look that Snake does. Where he's just like, damn it. I just, why can't we have nice things? That's what Thorfinn's face looks like. He's like, he's escaped. And he's like, why else would they be looking through the shed and searching for them? They're ransacking our bedroom. Why else would they be doing that? And of course, Anar's like, well, shit, he realizes the implications of this, that Arnheed's in danger. Yep. Meanwhile, we have the one guy, Badger, who has his arm bandaged up. And I was wondering what Snake had there in his lap, but it's his sword. He's sitting there holding his sword like he's contemplating what to do. And poor Spherical. Poor Spherical. Spherical's just sitting there. And he just, oh, he looks, Spherical just looks so tired and just like, ugh. Like he looks ragged. And meanwhile, there's Snake looking, looking fly as hell, but looking pissed too. Like, I didn't want to have to wake up and do this on my Sunday morning. They make his eyes so beautifully jade colored. Like, they're like an aquamarine. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mappa loves themselves, Snake. He looks like Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. And I... Could not be more into it. So, so I liked this. I liked, I like, we have basically, we have three, we have three groups 
of people right now. We have Arn, Heed, and Gardar who are in their own pocket of hell. You have Snake who's kind of conflicted of, okay, now what have I got to do? Damn it. And then you have Thorfinn and Einar who are also conflicted being like, well, how do we, we're slaves, but we like Arnheed. And we also have been working with Snake. Like, where? What do we do? the 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 alliances and everything. Everything is so tense and tightly wound right now. Like at any moment, it could snap. And it's like, ugh. so what do we do? Ah, uh, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's all I got. <laughs> A really good episode. I am now sad. I I was just getting used to being able to watch two episodes back to back. Maybe I could skip a week. No, I will not do that to you all because that would be highly cruel. And plus that I would not want to do that. So I, I'm really excited for next week. Episode 16 is going to be like the three fourths of the way mark. And again, we're dealing with all the stuff with Gardar and Arnheed and everything. But Canute is still off in his little boat heading this way to cause and wreck shit. And then you have Leaf and the others who are coming over to just wreck shit. So it's just... I have a feeling this season is going to end on a horrible cliffhanger and I'm going to be so bummed. <laughs> I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I'm just like, because the last season ended on like a cliffhanger and it was like, ah, oh, only now before I could just be, wait a few months and dive into season two. This time around, I'm going to likely have to wait a lot longer. And that's so frustrating. But I'm very curious to know your thoughts down below, um, what you all think about this episode uh it was really good but i'm really excited to see what's going to happen next week and um and go from there so in the meantime i hope you all have a wonderful week please stay safe take care and yeah i'll be back very soon with episode 16 of season two of vinland saga bye <laughs>